The uh, CAC, the Children's Advocacy Center, that's the second group that we gave to out of our Christmas offering. If you're a guest today, we received a Christmas offering on October, December 17th, December, and with the idea that we were going to give it away to local organizations. Uh, two weeks ago, we gave away a check for $3,000 to what's called P3, which is an organization that works in USD 250 to make sure that kids that maybe can't afford what they need to properly take care of their privates have what they need. And so that was our first one that we gave. And then based out of the offering last Sunday, we gave a $4,000 check that you just saw to the Children's Advocacy Center. So all totaled, what came in last Sunday was about $15,800. So thank you for your generosity. Thank you. We are acting as if it's a total of 16000 because that's what we're giving uh, this week. And I look forward throughout the service to share more with you. Uh, the CAC is amazing. Uh, they protect abused kids that have been abused physically and sexually. Yeah, there's way too many of that. Protect them from further shame and further harm as they go ahead and deal with the legal system and what has to be done there. Can you imagine the labels and nicknames kids that have been abused sexually or physically would get from their peers if they weren't able to have a group like that to come along and help guide them through that process? Labels that are placed on us by other people are usually designed to limit us. Not nicknames from buddies, but labels from people. Your donation towards that can help lift the labels that limit from these children. And as I was putting my message together this week, I didn't really put two and two together, but I realized that all the organizations that we are supporting are helping lift labels off of people. Now, I don't know what your label was, but in elementary school, my label was Lemonhead. Lemonhead. Based on uh, uh, messing up my last name, Layman. And uh, I wish I could say it was given to me by friends that cared about me or were just joshing with me, but it wasn't. No, it was given by people that had more social status than me to make sure they knew where I, where I stood or where I should kneel. In middle school, it was flat so. Flat so, because apparently someone that had social status said, hey, you look like your mother hit you in the head with a frying pan in the face, because apparently my nose does not stick out a lot, and I have a somewhat flat profile. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me is a flat, big, fat lie. A total lie. And then in high school, it was a flower power. Flower power. Because uh, when I ran, I apparently looked like the FTD guy. <laughs> At 51, I can laugh about it now because some of them are struggling with obesity and I'm running marathons. So, yeah, gotcha. But, but back then, oh man, labels limit. Labels limit. So when you look in the scripture, the very first book in the New Testament, which when Matthew was writing his gospel, he didn't know it was going to be the first book in, in what was going to be called the New Testament. It was never called the New Testament until 300 A.D. But he's writing to Jews, and he's going to say, hey, this Jesus guy is your Messiah. Matter of fact, let me show you how he's from the line of David and, and, and his history. And he starts laying this out, basically saying, hey, I'm going to tell you the Christmas story. And when I, before I get there, I'm going to tell you how it came to be. So in reality, everything I'm telling you all belongs in the Christmas story. So in reality, you can put all of this in your nativity. You can put all of it there. I lost my clicker again, seriously. That video is so awesome that we watch in the professionalism. I keep forgetting my clicker. There we go. And Matthew starts listing all these people. And some of the people he lists have blatant, limiting labels. Horrible ones. Why? Because they're part of the story or because they're the point of the story. So we're in Matthew chapter 1, the very first words of the New Testament. As you look at this, what's your label? What would your label be? Matthew chapter 1. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So Matthew's going to tell, hey guys, this is the Jesus guy's telling you about. He's the Messiah. The son of David. Ooh, ace of spades name. Way to start. The son of Abraham, another ace of spades. By the way, if you're playing poker with someone and they have two aces of spades, yeah, not good, not good. The Abraham was the father of Isaac, the father of Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron, the father of Ram, the father of Aminadab, the father of Nashon, the father of Salmon, like the fish. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was <clears throat> Rahab. Rahab. Uh, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of King David. But Rahab, he's writing to a Jewish audience. Rahab had a label. Maybe you know it, maybe you don't. If you do know Rahab's label, say it out loud with me. Rahab the harlot or prostitute. 
or if we wanted to use the word that would have the same weight that they would have used as Rahab the hooker. The same weight that the word would have of being called a harlot. In the Bible, people frequently had labels. If you know them, say them with me. John the? Ooh, good. Paul the? Uriah the? Sorry, I was just messing with you there. I don't expect any of you to know that one. Two of you did. Way to go, Destry. You, you get to sit on the front row this week. Way to go. Okay, how about from history? Alexander the? Attila the? Okay. Conan the? That's not history, by the way. Buffy the? You guys are sharp, man. Jabba the? Yeah, you're doing great. What's your label? The one you don't want. I doubt very much Jabba went around saying, hey, somebody call me Hunt. Because labels limit. What if, what if Attila the Hun wanted to open a flower shop? Ain't no one going to Attila the Hun's flower shop. Labels limit. Labels limit. Our Christmas offering is helping lift some of those labels. But does the whole Christmas story speak to what your label may be? What, what would be associated with your name? What have you associated with your name? That maybe you earned it, but maybe you didn't. Maybe someone just put that on you. Saddled you with it, which is a perfect term. Because that saddle limits the horse and allows the horse to be used. And sometimes maybe abused and driven too hard. Rahab the harlot creates tension in the story. Try putting that in your nativity scene. Mommy, here's the wise man. Who is this scantily clad woman over here? Yeah, nobody wants that figurine in their nativity, but she's there. And Matthew could have skipped over this. He didn't list every mother in the genealogy. But her part of the story might be the point of the story. Rahab's context in the Old Testament is simple. The Jewish people, the nation of Hebrews, they, they escaped from Egypt. They've been in the promised land, stuck there for 40 years out of their own stubbornness. They finally crossed the River Jordan, and they're getting ready to go to Jericho and attack Jericho. So they send two spies out to Jericho. Hey, go spy out the land. They send the two spies in there, checking things out. They get spotted. So they run and they hide in a house. It's Rahab's house. People come knocking on Rahab's door. Hey, have you seen those two spies? And she says, no, I haven't. No, no. Matter of fact, I think they were here, but I think they ran that way. And she protects the spies. One act of faith. One act of faith. We pick it up in Joshua 2. After the people trying to catch the spies take off, Rahab talks to the spies. Hey, we heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea when you guys came out of Egypt and what you did to those kings whose name I can't pronounce. And uh, you completely destroyed them. When we heard it, our hearts melted and everyone's courage failed because of you. For your Lord, for the Lord your God is God. For the Lord your God is God. So, hey, I helped you, would you help me? Would you spare my life? I spared your life, will you spare my life? And they respond to her, you bet, woman, that's what we'll do. Our lives for yours. You don't tell anyone what we're doing. When we come and tear this place down, we'll save you. One simple act of faith. And the faith is based on what she had heard, not what she had seen, not what she had experienced. Only on what she had heard, she acted out on one simple act of faith. I think your God is God. So the Israelites come, they take over the city. Joshua chapter 6. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the, there's her label again, go to the prostitute's house, bring her out and everything that belongs to her. So the young men go and they do that, they bring her out and her family, and they, they set her outside the camp, outside the camp, outside the camp of Israel. Then they burn the whole city and take all the valuables out, but Joshua spared Rahab the, and there's her label for all of history, the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. Now the Israelites were extremely picky on who lived with them, who was a foreigner and who was part of them. But she lived with them. That's amazing. A foreigner who was living with them. And every first century Jew who Matthew was writing to, Matthew was writing to first century Jews, hey, this Jesus is the Messiah. And by the way, here's his lineage. Abraham, David, da 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 Rahab, well, Rahab? Yeah. Rahab. Yeah. Someone who was an outsider, a foreigner, not just a foreigner outsider, a really far outsider. Because what does Rahab bring to the table? One simple act of faith. What does she not have? Years and years of religious righteousness. No, what she brings to the table is what she was. Years and years of horribleness. One simple act of faith can lift you above that label. So one day Rahab's walking down the street 
She may have been singing doo-wah diddy, but I don't think she was. But she was walking down the street, and this guy named Salmon goes, woo, and asks her out in spite of her label. And Salmon knows what her label is because everybody knows what her label is. Everybody does. Salmon asks her out. So this Jewish man marries this Canaanite woman who has been with lots and lots and lots of men. And they have a son. They name him Boaz, who grows up and marries Ruth. And they have a great-grandson eventually named King David. No matter what you've done, it doesn't mean you can't be part of what God has going on. I want to give you four simple observations that we can see from this. But before we get to the observations, back to the Christmas offering. The Christmas offering came in, and we've distributed it this week. We'll show you some more videos. One that we don't have a video for is we're going to be taking $1,000 of that Christmas offering and using it to invest in the blessing box across the street. Some of you are familiar with the blessing box across the street. People take food to it, so whoever's hungry, whether they're homeless or not homeless, but if they're hungry or they have needs, they can go get some food. Our goal with it is to, because it's not a ministry that we run, own, or operate, but it's, something, it's a ministry that sits on our property over there and that we want to support. And so we're going to be taking that $1,000 and trying to raise awareness, maybe trying to set up something that uh, a Facebook page and some other stuff, some advertising to get the word out to the community. So it's not just even believers that are helping out and supporting. So we'll be doing that as well. And then at the end of the service, you'll see a video of about another uh, donation that we gave to an organization that's limiting, lifting limiting labels, who's serving people that have labels and saving people who have labels. And it's a local church that's been doing some amazing stuff. Uh, but right now, I want to show you another organization that we supported. So as they're queuing that video up, here's another organization we support with our Christmas offering. Surprise! It's your birthday! <laughs> Come on, Joey. Come on. All right, so for you viewing at home, uh, I'm TJ Barno. I'm a member of Flag Church. Here with me is Pastor uh, Mark, who's doing the filming. Pastor Anthony is around here somewhere. And here in the room is about 15 or 20 of uh, me and Joey Himes' as peers and coworkers here. So um, Joey, on behalf of Flag Church, we'd like to make a donation to Out of Home Hope. Thank you so much. Yeah. Really appreciate it very much. No problem. Thank you. Comes out of our Christmas offering through the church. Um, so, why don't you go ahead and open that and give us your right. thoughts on what you see there. Holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. Don't fall over. Thank you so very much. Wow. Cool. Thank you. Wow. Wow. You're welcome. Um, and so we work directly with KBC Kansas today, and we actually prepare the packs and give them to KBC. So when they have that placement, they grab the pack and the kid has it before they even show up at the house. In terms of anything that's actually theirs, they only have what they grabbed as they left wherever they were picked up from. Um, the first foster children we ever had were actually picked up at a swimming pool, public swimming pool. And they showed up at our house at 2 a.m. in their swim trunks. And that's all they had. Just to be completely honest, we started this because we're people of faith. We believe that we have a responsibility to look after the orphan and the widow. We believe that Jesus told us that we're supposed to look after and care for those in need, um, those that are hungry and thirsty, those that are naked and without clothes. I mean, that's really the, right there where it, where it all started for us. Each pack includes um, a change of clothes. Um, so we try and I mean, clean underwear, clean socks, um, brand new stuff there, um, pants, shirts. Um, we try and make sure that they've got all those essentials, pajamas, um, and then we, then we aim for a couple things that are just for fun or to comfort. We also um, include toothbrush, toothpaste, deodorant for older, older kids that would need that. And then um, the other thing we're working to, it, to include in the future is just a generic note of encouragement. When I say generic, I mean we don't know who the kid is or what, what's going to happen with that kid. So we try to keep it simple, but something that's encouraging to them that just says, hey, this sucks right now but you're special and somebody cares about you. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you to everyone at Flag Church for your donation. Um, it really will be used to, to make a big difference in some kids' lives. So thank you again.
mean to add to the surprise, Joy, if you want to. Fitzgo would like to add to this donation as well to uh, double up on, on the ministry. So well, we are excited, so much. excited to have you not only here as an employee, but even more excited about what you're doing for the community. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. Um, really do appreciate it a lot. Um, it means a lot because um, I know that the impact it's going to make for a lot of kids. So thank you all. Amen. If you want some more information on Out of Home Hope, and maybe you want to become a participant with it, a donator to it, or involved with it, there's information on the Welcome Center for that. If you want information about the Children's Advocacy Center, there's information for that. If you're wondering why there's toy vehicles on my pulpit, it's because someone thought I needed a Mini Cooper for Christmas. Just a little note that says, sorry, not full size. <laughs> but you're getting closer, because earlier I got this one. So they're both Mini Coopers, but that's why they're there. They put them there for me. Both of those organizations are lifting shame and removing labels, removing labels. So let's get back to the story of Rahab being part of the Christmas story, kind of like part of the nativity. Four simple observations if you want to follow along in your notes. Number one, you can see on the screen, we all have labels. We all have labels. Some of you actually recently discovered a label that you had and you don't really want it. Derek the divorced or Barry the bankrupt. And maybe that's why you're back in his house today and we're glad that you're here. Some labels you've tried to distance yourself from, but they keep popping up, like Doug the Dropout or Frank the Felon. Uh, some labels are from an ex-spouse, and you wish you could undo what you've done. You're Abigail the Adulterer, or Charles the Cheater, or Lucy the Liar. Some labels are from secrets. You're Edward the Embezzler, or Tom the Thief, or Peter the Porn Addict. Or some labels are from habits. You're Darlene the Druggier, or Stephen the Stoner, or Andy the Alcoholic, or, or hidden labels. You're Gary the Grudge Holder, Evelyn the Envious, or Paul the prideful. We've all got labels in some way, shape, or another, but you don't have to lose the label before joining up with Jesus. You don't have to lose the label before joining with Jesus. Rahab didn't have any time to lose her label. It took one simple act of faith for her to move forward. Jesus' grace is bigger than his law. His grace is bigger than his law. When you approach God, sometimes the first thing you think about is your label. Oh, I want to come, oh, but, but I can't, but I can't, but, 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 but. Jesus invited people while they were still wearing their label. The man who wrote the Gospel of Matthew, his, 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 his name is Matthew the, anybody know? Tax collector. <laughs> nasty. And we think it's nasty in our culture. It is worse there. Romans, over the Jews. Hi, I'm Matthew. I'm going to go ahead and be a tax collector for the Romans and rip all my people off and keep some of the money for myself. He was the worst traitor possible. And Jesus did not go to Matthew and say, yo, Matthew, I'd like you to come follow me, but first you've got to get rid of a few things, and then you've got to go ahead and lose that label and get a new label and quit wearing that Dallas Cowboys t-shirt and wear something different. This is what you've got to do. This is what I want you to do. All right, Matthew, then you can follow me. No, he looked right past and through the label of tax collector and said, follow me. You know who didn't like it? the other disciples. Peter! Ah! But Jesus didn't budge. Follow me. Does he look past your label and right through your label? And say, follow me? But then your big butt pops up. But this, but this, but this, but this, but this. And just get your big butt out of the way. And follow him. You got excuses. I know you do. I got them too. But that's all they are. Excuses. Does he say that to you today? Follow me? Because your label doesn't limit God. It limits you. And limits you more than it has the power to because you let it. Rahab is guilty. Rahab is an outsider. But Rahab is learning that God's grace is big enough and large enough. Not just so Rahab can believe. Okay, Rahab, you, you prostitute, we'll let you believe. No, no, no. It's beyond belief. It's Rahab, you can come live with us. You can belong. You can belong. First service, we had a couple people who've moved away and been out of town coming back to visit. And it was so good to see them come, quote, unquote, home. Home. Rahab's label did not prevent her from living with them. Jesus does not see your label as a limit because your story is not very far from her story. Does your label limit you in this world? Probably so. But maybe it's time to move beyond belief into belonging because one act of faith can lift you above your label. One act of faith can lift you above your label. I would invite you to lean on the God who's leaning into you in spite of your label. To lean into the God who's leaning into you. To approach the God who has approached you while you're still wearing your label. And you've tried shedding that label. You've tried hard. And it's still there. 
I know you're, you're, you're busy, you're moving around, some of you are checking your phone. Give your eyeballs up here, everybody, just for a moment. I can't remember the last time I asked this congregation to do that. I really can't. He's bigger than your label. He loves you in spite of your label. Because, because of your label, you don't love yourself at times. Are you willing to quit believing what you say about you and start believing what he says about you? The invitation's there. But I can't lose my label. He's willing to look past it. Are you? Are you? Stand with me, would you? Maybe it's time to get a new label. Instead of Frank the felon, it's Frank the forgiven. Instead of Alice the ostracized, it's Alice the accepted. Instead of Larry the jerk, it's Larry the loved. Yeah, can we bow our heads and our hearts across this place?